Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Appropriate Room Use, part one of two webinars looking at room classifications and the guidelines for design and construction. This webinar will consider the requirements for exam room, a procedure room, and an operating room to help designers and healthcare organizations determine which room to specify based on clinical needs. My name is Heather Livingston. I'm the Director of Operations for FGI and Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. FGI is proud to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Brian Langlands is a principal, senior medical planner, and regulatory expert at NBBJ based out of the New York office. He helped the company become recognized by Fast Company Magazine as the most innovative architecture firm in the world in 2018. Brian has worked with many of the top academic medical centers and healthcare systems, including NYU Langone Health, Mount Sinai, Penn Med, Geisinger, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Jefferson Health, University of Rochester Medical Center, and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Brian was a member of FGI's 2018 Health Guidelines Revision Committee and is a member of the 2022 HGRC, as well as a member of the Steering Committee and Chair of Beyond Fundamentals Oversight Committee. David Shapiro, MD, is an anesthesiologist who has had extensive experience serving as a department chair, medical director, and board member of several ambulatory surgery centers. In addition, Dr. Shapiro has served as a national medical director on behalf of ASC Management Corporations prior to establishing his consulting practice. His areas of expertise encompass a wide range of disciplines, primarily focused on all aspects of ASC development, administration, and operations. These include clinical quality, regulatory compliance, and medical liability in the ambulatory surgery arena. David serves on the boards of the Florida Society of Ambulatory Surgery Centers, ASC Quality Collaboration, and the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare. Dr. Shapiro also serves in various other capacities, capacities with several other professional organizations, and most relevant to today's presentation, he's a member of FGI's Board of Directors. Welcome to you both, and thanks so much for being here today. Um, thanks, Heather. So uh, this is Brian, and um, I know David and I both uh, are very excited about this webinar, about trying to take some of the mystery out of what cases and what types of rooms should be used, uh, especially in relation to exam treatment procedure and operating rooms. As Heather mentioned, uh, this is a part one of two parts. The second part, uh, which is a separate webinar um, with uh, Tobias Gilk, is focused on imaging rooms. So it really builds off of this first uh, seminar, which is uh, more foundational on the exam procedure and operating rooms, and the second one is the imaging room. So if that is something that uh, interests you, please um, sign into that webinar. We are looking forward to questions at the end of this, uh, if there is time, and also we do know that uh, if there isn't time, uh, further feedback, you can always send uh, questions uh, to the, uh, uh, the webinar uh, information, but also to FGI, and we will certainly collect answers and get those back to you. So getting on to today's webinar, um, it's basically going to start with a description and um, commentary by uh, David, really focusing in on invasive procedures. Then I will spend a bit of time talking about a study that was done by the American Society of Anesthesiologists and Clemson University, um, uh, where Clemson actually has an architecture program uh, with a focus on healthcare. 
we will go into the work that was done for the 2018 FGI guidelines in establishing the anesthesia zone or the anesthesia work zone. And then David and I both together will take us through the types of rooms and the types of cases and the room classifications and requirements for exam treatment rooms, procedure rooms, and operating rooms. And at the very end, quickly, we will just go over a new allowance within the 2018 guidelines about the ability to be able to combine pre and post procedural patient care stations. So if we go to the next slide here, this is just a slide sharing with you what uh, sections we will be reviewing today. Um, if you want to have your books out and go through it, uh, you can see the sections listed. Primarily, we're looking at the exam procedure operating rooms and the associated summary table. You can see there that we have the listed sections for both the hospital edition and also the outpatient edition. Much of what we are reviewing today is similar in content for both editions. The information applies to both. We will distinguish when something only applies to outpatient compared to inpatient or outpatient compared to hospital. However, a lot of the content is similar. However, the books are structured slightly differently and these will fall in different sections within the two books. Now, without Thanks, further Brian. ado, I am going to uh, introduce David, and he will take it from here. Thanks, Brian. Um, what I wanted to do uh, to lead off and to follow up on the stage that Brian has set for us is tackle one of the probably the most difficult things or terms that we want to use today. It comes up quite frequently in our discussions as we were preparing these guidelines, and it comes up quite clinically when um, those of us that are clinicians do talk about patient procedures and patient treatments. And that's the, uh, that's the term invasive. Um, and in this regard, we're going to be applying it to a descriptor, if you will, of the procedures and we're, that we're going to be talking about today. And we're really going to be talking about how that translates to the choice of the environment in which we perform those procedures. But the term invasiveness is a difficult one to really nail down an easy definition. Um, it's really a continuum or a scale. It doesn't have definitive or absolute demarcations between discrete values. I'd consider it something to be like temperature. We're all pretty much in agreement what's cold and what's hot, but there's a lot of variation to where each of us would um, affix a moniker to a temperature value in between those or even at either end of cold or hot. So the way we've been using invasive procedure, again, is a relative term, but what we're talking about is one that does require some type of sterility or asepsis in the field around the procedure. And it really incorporates many, many different kinds of procedures. We've, we've got um, some examples, but before we, before we get into examples, really just want to drive home the the um, most important probably of those considerations is that risk of infection. And that's one of the things that as we talk about the environments and describe those to you in this presentation, we're really thinking about what equipment, what personnel, and also what measures we can take to prevent infection from occurring in the patient for whom we are treating in whatever site of service we're providing it. So on the next slide, take a look at the um, glossary, and this is the glossary that's in the current or 2018 editions of the guidelines, and that is one describing an invasive procedure in one of the many forms it's described, and that is referring to that sterile or aseptic field, and we're going to use those terms, even though they're not precisely the, cha the same, pretty much interchangeably as we talk about those things. So what we're talking about is entry into a part of the body where there are not normally um, pathogenic organisms. So again, we want to make sure that what we're doing to the patient is not introducing any disease from the outside, especially it would be carried by um, pathogens or bacteria or any other contaminants that may be found in the outside environment. So this could be a, a surgical procedure to manipulate body organs. It could be the insertion of a foreign body, for instance, a prosthetic valve in the heart, or even something less invasive, if you will, to use our term, 
like a uh, vascular access for a dialysis patient. We've also mentioned burns and the idea, um, also a nod to the idea that many, many of our procedures these days are done laparoscopically, but that also many of those laparoscopic procedures do have a reasonable probability, not exceptionally high, of turning into an open procedure. So again, we really want to be protecting the um, internal organs of the patient that are undergoing whatever procedure it is that we're performing. So what we want to look at in the next slide is really looking at the three rooms that we have divided our consideration into. So the first one for the less or least or even non-invasive procedures would be that exam or treatment room. And we're going to talk about these more in detail, but just want to develop the overview. The second of those would be um, a procedure room. And that is really, as you'll see, somewhere in between the th the the, the exam or treatment room and the operating room, which is going to be the third one displayed on this slide. What they, what to determine which patient at which time for which procedure really involves a lot of clinical decision making, it involves a risk assessment, it involves a lot of knowledge and a lot of information exchange between nursing staff, surgical staff, anesthesia staff, but also with consideration to what's available in a given community and certainly within a given facility. But we are going to try to nail down some of the characteristics that help us, especially as we're in the build stages, define Define what these different types of rooms are and what the characteristics of them should be. So for the three major room types that we have decided to call them, um, as, as you can see on this chart, it really just reflects what we took a look at in the prior slide. We've got an exam or treatment room. And once you start talking about environmental controls, that is probably one of the easiest metrics to apply to distinguish these three from each other. So for an exam or treatment room, again, that's for less or least invasive procedures. It really does not need the environmental controls. And we're going to be more specific about that in a minute or two. That, uh, and then when you move to procedure rooms, um, you don't have to have all the environmental controls that an operating room would, but you do need to have some of them because that's going to be where you perform procedures on patients that require some kind of high-level disinfection or perhaps sterile instruments and some of those environmental controls. So again, this is a little bit of an in-between stage, but it does reflect some qualifications and some criteria of either the exam or treatment room of, or operating room. When you move to operating room, that is a little bit easier to define, especially because those environmental controls are very well specified in the ASHRAE 170 document so that we have some really good metrics to determine what it is that we need to put in place in order to consider an, a site or an environment to become indeed an operating room. And Brian is now going to take us through some diagrams that will help you hopefully visualize the distinguishing characteristics that we've spoken about. Brian? Thank you. So with that uh, background on the three types of rooms that we've been discussing, these rooms can exist and be accessed from different locations within the surgical suite. We just wanted to share a diagram here where when we consider the location of these rooms, that the exam room can be accessed and uh, typically is accessed from the unrestricted zone within a surgical suite. It can also fall out of any surgical suite uh, period, but for this diagram, we're actually considering an exam room within a surgical suite. The procedure room where David has um, uh, aptly described as being the sort of uh, the relative term or the moving target of the warm area before the two opposites of the clean, uh, of the hot and cold, that really the procedure room can be accessed from an unrestricted area or a semi-restricted area. And with that comes operational implications that need to be carefully considered. When you are deciding if a procedure room is accessed from the unrestricted uh, it is um, much more easily um, um, uh, accessed by staff, uh, certain reduced protocols uh, with uh, what um, uh, uh, clothing and other things you can have. When the procedure actually falls uh, within the semi-restricted zone, 
more than likely it is a more um, a, a, a more intensive uh, high acuity uh, procedure which does not fall into the fully invasive zone of an operating room but what it does do is that uh, it comes with the associated requirements of falling behind or uh, behind the red line or within the semi-restricted zone so when you are thinking about the procedure room um, that is the one that you have to have conversations and discussions with uh, the institution, your clinicians, the designers, infection control, regulatory, uh, because that is the one room which could exist on either side. With the exam room and the operating room, we really don't have much choice. Uh, they need to fall within the two areas that they're going to fall, but the procedure room really is a choice and, and needs to have some focus and uh, attention paid to it. I'm going to take a moment and go over a really wonderful study that was done by the American Society for, uh, of Anesthesiologists with Clemson University. What uh, this study really did was it observed 10 cardiothoracic operations. And you can see in the diagram here, and I'm going to put my cursor over it, I'm not sure if you can see it on the webinar, but in the upper right hand corner, in the blue is observer one, and in the mid to bottom left side near the door is observer number two. And what Clemson and ASA did was they actually put observers into rooms, but before the rooms, the observers were really looking at three um, distinct um, areas or focus or process along the continuum of care of pre-procedure, so really arriving at pre-op up until the time you're taken into the OR, during procedure, which is obviously during the length of the procedure until the time you exit, the patient exits the OR, and then post-procedure from the moment the patient exits the OR to the time when the patient either exits the PACU or phase two or is discharged or admitted. And they wanted to see from, um, from a design point of view how many disruptions occurred and to understand whether any of those disruptions were associated with layout, configuration, design, and how many of those were more operational uh, disruptions that were less controlled by the environment and were more opportunistic and just uh, were uh, disruptions that occurred. So what you see and what was discovered is that the thicker the line is the higher activity in and out and around. So you can almost think of that as speed or the number of times someone moves back and forth. And then the redder, if you move towards red, red associates the highest concentration of disruptions. What you'll see on this diagram is the disruptions that occurred within the 10 that they observed within the 10 uh, operations. Uh, the highest concentration of those were actually at the anesthesiologist area, uh, basically at the patient's head. The second one following that, um, and I hope on the webinar this shows that the area where the surgeon is, is actually orange, it's not as red. So while it was high uh, disruption area at that location, certainly by far the greatest disruptions occurred within the zone that we would call the anesthesia zone. So what did they find? They found that for 10, cardiothoracic observations, uh, operations, they observed 1,080 disruptions. Those disruptions you can see are categorized in many different um, areas or categories. Ones that we have as architects and designers and FGI no control over, meaning equipment failures, uh, communication issues, things like that, we don't have much control over. Um, the one that you see and the largest category there is 31% were attributed by how they uh, determined to physical layout. 
And then on the right hand side, you can start seeing what, uh, how they categorize some of those uh, frequency and things that happened uh, that they attributed to the physical layout. Inadequate use of space, uh, the furniture uh, wrongfully positioned, equipment in the wrong location. Other categories that we won't go into, you know, can be shift changes, um, someone's cell phone goes off, uh, spilling, dropping of items, et cetera. So if you peel off the preoperative and we don't look at that and the postoperative and we don't look at that, and we focus in on the operative, we actually see that there are 154 interruptions, general interruptions, and 145 uh, of physical layout, which really brings you to about 300 disruptions that you would um, associate here. The number two, although one was a general interruption, the number two that we're really concerned about is the physical layout. So that's 145 over 10 cases. So one would argue that on average there's 14.5 physical layout um, disruptions or uh, issues that occur within one operation. If you then take those physical layout issues and you look at what is happening, most of them are occurring in the anesthesiologist area. So that's uh, 92 of the 145. So nine times out of um, uh, nine times in each operation case, there was some issue with the physical layout that occurred within that anesthesiologist area. The reason we're highlighting this study is that it reinforces the importance of getting the space, um, uh, amount of space required about and needed for the anesthesiologist to actually set up. Uh, their equipment and their furniture in the positions that work well, that work from a safety point of view, and that work from an efficiency point of view. And that ties into what we're going to go through next, which is a um, study that we did ourselves um, in order to establish what is the proper amount of space required in order to uh, set up that equipment and then operate and run that equipment during an operation. So David? Thank you, Brian. So as, as Brian has kind of teed up for us, what we're going to look at together right now is that anesthesia zone and how we really went about trying to quantify something that really had not been done before um, from the Facility Guidelines Institute. So what we really did was spend a lot of time, we did a lot of mock-ups, we did a lot of simulations, and tried to look at exactly not only the activities, but what are the equipment, what are the personnel, what are the needs of the things that go on, if you will, at the head of the table, or certainly that end of the table for most procedures. In the slide that you see on the screen, um, you see a quite a large anesthesia machine and an individual who I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, perhaps perfecting their golf game, but they're clearly not given anesthesia. Regardless, it does give you an indication of the size of, of a typical anesthesia machine and an indication of the amount of equipment that is usually attached, if not absolutely proximate to the anesthesia machine that the anesthesia provider needs to have available to them without moving a really away at all from the patient, most particularly from the head of that patient for which they have the most control and, and responsibility. So what the task group did was really study in great detail um, all of the things that I've mentioned and all of the aspects of what goes into allowing the anesthesia providers to conduct their trade and really what allows them to take the best care of the patient as they and modern medicine know how to provide. So some of the equipment is, is elucidated on that slide and we'll flip to the next slide because what we really wanted to do was to incorporate all of that into the anesthesia zone and really take a look, a 360 degree, really full look at what is going on in a typical operating room. Just a word about this slide, you, we do have a picture of an anesthesiologist with a lot of their toys, and I'll admit as an anesthesiologist, we do like our toys, and I believe that's a architect on the table. Um, getting ready to have an anesthetic if the anesthesiologist uh, turns on the appropriate dials. At any rate, we used uh, a pretty realistic uh, simulation 
to really make some assessments about the size and the scope and the complexity of all the anesthesia equipment and again the space that's needed to utilize that. So we were looking between the anesthesiologist or whatever anesthesia providers in the room how they how they can access the patient and again particularly the patient's head for most cases and and how much uh, equipment mainly the machine and what's generally known as an anesthesia cart um, how much room that takes up and how much room is needed to deploy all the things that are needed to um, handle a case. On the next slide, what we did was try to assign some measurements, and now we've gone from those really 360 and three-dimensional to two. So we wanted to just kind of put a box around this, and that would be the width that we um, came to. About eight feet is, is where we landed if you take a look at all that equipment. Now, I will tell you that that is um, on the large size of anesthesia equipment. You've got a couple display screens incorporated. You've got a whole lot of monitors. You have a sizable anesthesia cart, which contains a lot of medications and supplies and equipment needed to deliver an anesthetic. But at any rate, the, uh, the figure that we arrived at that you're going to see in some diagrams that Brian's going to go over was that eight foot width. On the subsequent slide, you take a look at the depth or how far back from the head of the table uh, in most configurations. Again, the, all this equipment extends. And we also incorporated the idea of an outer perimeter on the far side of the anesthesia equipment and came out with a measurement of approximately six feet. So that is the one, these measurements, the eight and the six, that you'll see carried through in the subsequent, subsequent um, diagrams that we're going to articulate and interpret for you. So back to you, Brian. Great. So here what you see is uh, for planning purposes, we assumed a three by seven foot gurney or stretcher within the operating room. And then we actually, to scale, um, uh, apply the anesthesia machine in a, a very simplistic uh, simplistic uh, graphic way, uh, the cart, the stool for the anesthesiologist, and wanted to then determine and apply what David has just gone over, which is that eight foot wide uh, amount of space, the six foot deep amount of space, which is uh, 48 square feet, and that 48 square feet uh, really establishes a zone or area of space that is required in order to set up all the equipment pre-procedure. So uh, determining that that is the safe amount of space that we need at the head of the patient or the table in order to set up and get that uh, equipment ready uh, for the procedure. As we know that when the procedure begins and is underway, the equipment and the position, uh, the anesthesiologists start moving towards or really uh, coming in closer to the patient's head or the head of the table. So that equipment starts contracting towards the table. And in some OR design where it is important to have circulation where you are able to walk around the anesthesiologist or the anesthesia zone, we did acknowledge that you could use the two feet uh, width of that uh, six foot depth uh, to circulate around that. We do know that many uh, operations and many OR configuration does not plan for that circulation to the north. And there's often a lot of equipment along that wall, uh, including uh, computers and other things. So we did want to be able to demonstrate that after the equipment is set up, when the procedure begins, the equipment starts moving towards the table and there technically is space free um, above that equipment uh, should circulation be required. So um, what we're doing here is we are now actually going into our section that we're going to speak about the exam procedure and operating rooms. And at the top here, you can see the tables that are associated and pretty much everything you see here will be shown in that table with the exception of what you see in the red and the white. The red and white is highlighted because these are uh, excerpts from ASHRAE 170. And that really is a focus 
uh, on air changes, the mechanical considerations, pressurization of the rooms, diffuser requirements, and you will not find that within the table. We have placed it in the table for this presentation in order to facilitate uh, a more sort of cohesive and better uh, demonstration of um, the sort of factors we want to get across to the audience. But you will not find this in the table, and you'll have to actually go to the back of the book or to a separate ASHRAE 170. However, the, we have reviewed the exam room treatment procedure and operating rooms. We've reviewed the room type. We're going to go into that a little bit further. Uh, we've talked generally, David has spoken generally about the room use. I showed some diagrams as to where the location of those exams uh, will fall. And then what we're going to do for the next two columns is for each one of these room types, we are going to get into detail, really focusing in on what the differences are between the types of rooms when it comes to the ASHRAE requirements and when it comes to surfaces, um, more, more particularly the ceiling, floors, and wall finishes. So at a high level, in a... Uh, I, I'm an architect, so I like, I like diagrams. I like reading narratives and words and seeing if you try to draw them, they actually work. So this was just an exercise, uh, again, for this presentation, where in the simplest terms, if you took the clear floor area minimum requirements and the minimum clear width dimensions that are listed for these types of rooms, and you just threw them on a piece of paper, you put a relative uh, sort of um, uh, ratio of length to width. These are the rooms that we are going to discuss today, and these are the number of rooms that we're focused in on. You will see there are many other rooms. Uh, we are not focusing in or talking about behavioral health room in the ED, or fast track room, or trauma room, or many, or a specialty OR inpatient, which is larger. So, but we, for the sort of, um, uh, the foundational work, these are the rooms that we are going to be working on and focusing in. So now David is actually going to, the way this is going to work is for each of these types of rooms, David is actually going to talk about the room definition from a clinical point of view, uh, clinician point of view, and talk about uh, typical uh, cases that occur within each type of room. I will then follow for each one of these rooms talking about the classification, going into that chart and matrix that we looked at before, uh, nailing in and focusing in in detail on what the ASHRAE and mechanical requirements are, the requirements for surfaces. And then uh, after that, uh, there are diagrams, clearance zone diagrams that we've called for each of the types of spaces that really show you um, how those rooms can be laid out. So um, handing to you, David. Sure, thanks, Brian. So just briefly, I'm going to try to introduce um, the rooms uh, and the way that we have differentiated them from one another as we've started to develop during this presentation. So the first ones, are again, talking about probably the least invasive things that are going to be conducted in them. The way that those, um, the way, the reason why we have this this slide named exam and ED treatment room, ED standing for emergency department, is that both of those rooms are extremely similar, but just the uh, lexicon in each of those areas is a little bit different. So the, the components and the characteristics of the room may be the same, but given the external context, whether they're located in or off of an emergency department or in another part of a medical office building or in a healthcare facility, really that drives the distinguishing characteristic. But essentially, once you look in those rooms, they are pretty much the same. So they are rooms in which we are going to do procedures which do not require some of the special attributes that we've started to build into the procedure and the operating room. So uh, certainly you can do an exam in a treatment room or give a treatment in an exam room, but again, it's the same lower intensity type of, of procedure that's being done on a less acute patient so that we don't need some of the things that we are building with you and we will be building in the subsequent slides characterize those procedures and operating rooms. Just for some examples, um, we'll switch to the next slide. 
And again, we've um, put down five, but there could be 500 or possibly even 5,000 activities that could be conducted in these types of rooms. Uh, anything from a, an exam or a history and physical uh, to uh, sort of some minor, again, we start to talk about that horrible word invasiveness, but let's say a dermatologic procedure that wouldn't require anything uh, for anesthesia, doesn't require any of the characteristics in terms of certainly air exchange changes or anything else that we've talked about uh, that would require it to be done in anything other than an exam, a typical exam or treatment room of a much smaller size than we would find for either of the other two kinds of rooms. So Brian is going to talk a little bit more about this classification in the following slide. So here uh, we actually have gone over room type, room use, and location previously, and we're going to focus in on the ventilation and surfaces. The uh, of the three types of spaces, exam procedure and operating room, the exam room is obviously for non-invasive procedures, and therefore uh, has um, uh, the word lower might not be the appropriate word, but the uh, lower requirements, less stringent requirements in terms of ventilation and uh, the cleanability uh, of surfaces. So what you'll see here for general exam rooms, we have four total air changes per hour, uh, two of which are outside air changes per hour. And for some specific exam rooms like GI and other things like that, uh, there is a recommendation for six total air changes per hour. and uh, to uh, uh, outside air changes per hour. Important here is that there really is no pressure requirement uh, between this room and any adjacent space, and the adjacent space more typically is always a corridor. Um, so really this can be uh, balanced neutral or uh, but does not to be uh, it need to be uh, negative pressure or positive pressure. You may decide to do uh, something like that if typically you're doing a one type of uh, uh, sort of um, uh, treatment or um, uh, you're finding frequently you're using this room for a particular type of patient that you might want to balance it in a certain direction but there is no requirement. The diffuser array is just your normal overhead uh, supply and re return diffusers. What you'll see on the last column to the right surfaces, cleanable with routine house housekeeping equipment. This means you can have any type of ceiling tile there. Um, you know, always recommend uh, ceiling type in healthcare settings that uh, it's coded for healthcare, uh, but technically um, there there is no restriction here. It can be tegular, it can have designs in it, um, you know, things like that. Floor, we're really, we're not saying it's monolithic, it's cleanable, uh, slip resistant, et cetera. And the wall finishes are washable. When we get into uh, the other spaces, washable is replaced with, you know, cleanable, scrubbable, uh, and things like that. The rooms below, we're going to go into detail on the next slides. So let's take the smallest of the rooms. We're looking at outpatient, the orange book. So the smallest of the three exam rooms that are listed or you find within those books is the typical outpatient exam room. You will see that there is a requirement for 80 square feet of clear floor area for this type of room and that there is a requirement for two foot eight uh, clearance at two sides and the foot of the examination table or recliner. For this diagram, for this purpose, uh, I have located in here an examination table, a, a typical size. So the diagram on the left is what is the requirement and what we need to prove to our various uh, regulatory agencies who review our drawings that we do have a room design and layout that can afford the clearances on these three sides. However, the diagram in the middle there um, does allow you and acknowledges that we do know that in many outpatient um, uh, um, sort of um, areas and, and uh, institutions where, where clinics uh, that the exam table is pushed up against a corner or against one wall. So if you read there in the small print, a room, and this is actually written uh, within the FGI guidelines, a room arrangement in which an exam table recline or a chair is placed at an angle closer to one wall than another or against a wall to accommodate the type of patient being served shall be permitted. So 
we need to make sure that on the left, you're able to have the clearances on three sides, but you could, for example, in the middle there, you could push the uh, table or, or, or chair, it could be at an angle or in the corner or to one side, and you just need the two foot eight uh, clearance to the side where you are circulating or the uh, work is going to be performed or the consult or the examination. So for the outpatient specialty exam room, uh, you will find that the requirement is 100 square feet, clear floor area. It has some more particular requirements, and those requirements are three foot six at the side of head or foot um, of the exam table or chair that corresponds with the care provider's expected work position. In this diagram here, I have shown an assumption that the care provider only needs to be at one side and one foot of the, uh, let's say, exam table here. And that is what I am showing. If the care provider needed to be on three sides, then we would actually have a differently shaped room or we recommend a larger room. And then it says one foot at all sides of the exam table or chair other than the work position. Um, so you'll see the one foot there. Uh, specialty exam rooms are, you know, ENT, um, I, other things like that. Um, and the reason we call them specialty is they often have uh, more equipment in the rooms. And you may bring more people into the room uh, because of the special nature uh, of the examination. So, for example, we know ear, nose, and throat, and other things, they often have its own cart, it has a special chair, and things like that. Um, so, essentially, I do, um, let's go to the next slide, and then I'll, uh, I'll mention something that I think is quite important. For the hospital exam room, the clear floor area is 120 square feet, and that a requirement, uh, again, three sides clear, uh, three feet clearance at the sides and the foot of the examination table. Similar to the allowance for the outpatient exam room, in the middle here, um, it does again acknowledge that you can then push the table or recliner at an angle against a wall as long as you provide the three foot clearance in order for the uh, clinician to do the work about the patient. And um, uh, there is a requirement actually here that there is a 10 foot minimum width within this room. The other two rooms that we saw did not have a minimum clear width, but the hospital exam room does say uh, it requires a minimum clear width of uh, 10 feet, which means your room must be, uh, if you're going to have it only 10 feet wide, it must be 10 by 12. Uh, something I do want to stress, um, is that when we refer to clear floor areas and minimum requirements and minimum clear widths, what we are saying and what FGI is um, really assessing here is that any amount of space under that amount, you are jeopardizing safety, efficiency, operational impacts and things like that. We are not recommending that all spaces be designed to only the clear floor area and the minimum requirements. We are establishing a base point from which you then grow from and the rooms become larger. And why do they become larger? They become larger from all the questions you need to ask and consider. Uh, what type of patient typically comes? Are they of a particular size? Uh, specific culture, uh, are they bringing one or two or three typically family members or visitors with them? Uh, how much cabinetry do you need in the room? How many people do you need to actually do the examination? What size is the exam table? Does the door swing into the room? Does, is the door 42 inches and not 36? All of these need to be considered and 
built upon to grow larger than the minimum requirement. So the minimum requirement is the springboard, the starting point to then determine what your requirements are for the room. Um, and they are establishing a mark that you cannot go below. So uh, back to David. Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, we're gonna move away from those exam and uh, emergency department treatment rooms to really the midpoint in our march through the continuum from, um, as we said before, the exam through the procedure up to the operating room. This mid one is probably the one that causes the most controversy because, again, it shares the characteristics of what we've already talked about, those exam and treatment rooms, and it, it does share a lot of characteristics with the operating rooms that we'll talk about subsequently. But let's just take a minute and see if we can elucidate exactly what the procedure room has that distinguishes it from either of the other two. So these are these are essentially um, designed to be rooms in which a lot of different procedures can be done, but again, do not require that environmental controls that we specifically will be describing for the operating room to the extent that they are required in the operating room setting. Many of you will take a look at this list and quite rightfully say, well, some of these procedures can be done safely and effectively in an exam or treatment room, or it safely and effectively in an operating room. And I would completely agree, as I think would everyone at Facility Guidelines Institute. However, these are just examples, and that's really all they are, of the wide range of procedures that, given the right appropriate context for the patient, for the um, for the providers in the involved in the procedure, these are some of the things that can be done in what we are going to be describing to you in a little more detail as a procedure room. So again, looking at this as a midpoint, we're going to be thinking about midway between more and less invasive, midway between lower and higher acuity, and then just start talking about some extra things that may be in the room. So may or may not have some anesthesia equipment. You may or may not have some extra personnel, maybe anesthesia providers, possibly some nursing staff. And then you may actually have some additional caregivers that are assisting with the procedure itself directly. So again, as we move midway, uh, Brian's going to take you back to um, breaking down some of the specifics that are inherent in this classification of a procedure room. Brian. The ventilation here for the procedure room, uh, you will see that we have 15 total air changes per hour and three outside air changes per hour, which means uh, from the exam room, which had four or six, uh, we are pushing more air through this room in order to try to have a cleaner environment. Uh, by doing so, we're also uh, requiring that the room be positive pressure in relationship to the adjoining spaces, and but uh, we still remain with the standard diffuser and return array. The surfaces here, you will start to see that we uh, begin to have some limitations. We are saying that if you are going to have lay-in ceilings, they are permitted, but you are not going to be allowed to have the perforated, tegular, serrated, highly textured uh, tiles. If you do have cut tiles, they need to be sealed or painted on the edges uh, so they are not open. And with the lay-in um, with the lay-in ceiling, they either need to be gasketed so they don't pop up, or they need to be at least one pound per square foot. The reason for this is to try to discourage um, the environment from above the ceiling coming down and uh, infiltrating the environment within the room help prevent dust and other items like that. The floors uh, can be what we had in the exam room, uh, no special requirement. However, uh, there is a requirement for specific types of uh, rooms, endo, euro, cysto, rooms that um, I think it's fine to say rooms that are typically messier, um, more fluids and other things, that these uh, are going to have monolithic flooring with the integral code base that goes up six, six inches on the wall. The uh, wall finishes are going to be free of fissures, open joints, and crevices. So now going into the diagrams for these types of rooms, here uh, for both the same for hospital and outpatient, this is our uh, typical procedure room, minimum requirements. 
minimum requirements are to based on a three by seven uh, gurney or uh, stretcher for uh, planning purposes, but really around that to have three foot six on the two sides and three foot at the foot and the head. You actually add that up, you do the calculation, that is 10 by 13, that turns out to be the minimum clear floor area. For the procedure room that we then acknowledge anesthesia and anesthesia equipment, full anesthesia equipment is going to be used on a regular basis. We then apply the anesthesia zone that we described earlier, the 48 square feet, which really requires six feet uh, at the patient's head. Um, so we look at that. We have three foot six on the two sides. We have three foot at the foot, and then we have six feet at the head. You actually calculate that out, that's 10 by 16. Our smallest size procedure room for hospital and outpatient that accommodates anesthesia equipment will be 10 by 16. And now we're going to uh, focus in on the operating room environment. Great. Thanks, Brian. So uh, for those of you that are still hanging in there, and I hope you are, we're in the home stretch here, and we're going to consider the third of our main categories of environments or rooms. So this one, finally, is the operating room that we've referred to so much. And again, higher or highest of the three on the scale of invasiveness and patient acuity. So this is the one that is going to require all those environmental controls, especially the ones related to ventilation that are in the ASHRAE 170, as Brian mentioned earlier. This this is also the one that um, for most procedures that are going to be done in there, they do require a sepsis and a sterile field. So most of the equipment and, um, and uh, personnel will be arrayed in this room so that the sterile field can be maintained throughout the procedure. And that's one of the things you'll see should you have occasion to visit a working operating room is that sterile field that's uh, reflected a little bit in that diagram, although it's difficult to see, is the part immediately uh, adjacent to the patient. And, and once you move away from the patient towards either the periphery of the room, even uh, including the side or the um, part of the room layout where the anesthesiologist and the anesthesia equipment are located. We do have some examples on the subsequent slide, but again, these are infinite as there are so many surgical procedures that can be done in these kinds of rooms. And most of the things that we've had, uh, that we have listed in here are things that, again, in most cases, there are certainly exceptions, do require those environmental controls beginning with the restricted access to the room itself, and then the way that the ventilation and the equipment and the uh, asepsis is conducted in the room to make sure that, again, what we, are pro what we are trying to do is provide an environment to conduct these procedures in, in which the chance of infection will be minimized, if not obliterated. So we do want to take close attention to making sure that all the details of the operating room construction are met including the size that we're going to be talking about on the next slide and all the other variables that go into classifying a room as an operating room. So I'll have Brian start sharing some of those with you in the next slide. Great. So here, the ventilation, we are actually going to see a uh, drastic change. We are seeing 20 total air changes per hour, four outside air changes per hour, positive pressure, but we do not have the typical uh, simple uh, diffuser um, and return array, supply and return in the ceiling. We are having what people often refer to as a laminar flow array. Uh, the supply diffuser array extends a minimum of 12 inches beyond the footprint of the surgical table on each side. So that means in some cases you need to consider uh, some for flexibility of rooms, some surgeons and anesthesiologists like to start the patient in one position and turn them uh, 90 degrees to another. If that's the case, you really should be designing it where the diffuser array extends 12 inches past that table uh, in both directions. And we also see that we have the low sidewall returns uh, to the two sidewalls with the exhaust grills. So what that means is air is coming in above the patient, coming down over the patient, 
and actually flowing out to the low side walls. There is some air recirculation that just happens naturally, but there is no forced recirculation of air. Um, the concept is that fresh air and clean air is going over and past the patient and out. So surfaces, uh, here we go, monolithic ceilings. Uh, we'll share with you and um, David will remember the uh, heated discussions that there were uh, proposals on the table in the 2018 FGI guidelines that says, why don't we allow uh, non-monolithic ceilings uh, which border outside the diffuser array for operating rooms? The argument for that was that how can we call ceilings monolithic anymore when they are penetrated every, uh, if not a uh, few feet or uh, every few six inches, but with access panels, um, lighting, cameras, the Wi-Fi ears, the exciters, all these things, uh, we are beginning to ask the question, is there such a term as monolithic ceiling? Uh, that did not go forward, so we are saying that outside of that diffuser array or along the perimeter of the OR, we are going to have monolithic ceiling, which means things like if any access panels are there, they do require to be gasketed. The ceilings need to be scrubbable, not wipeable, not cleanable, but scrubbable. Uh, you'll see there with uh, specific uh, chemicals and things like that. The flooring must be monolithic, have the integral cove base, and then obviously the walls need to be uh, pretty um, um, resilient walls. We are going to go over three, outpa uh, three types of ORs uh, for minimum requirements. Two of them we, fall, uh, we find within the outpatient uh, FGI edition, and one of them we find within the hospital uh, portion. We are going to begin with the hospital one. Uh, just take a moment, I do want to let you know that uh, a lot of the material that you're hearing and going to see is the clearances uh, listed are found in the appendix. They are not listed in the uh, minimum requirements. They're more informational, but the diagrams that you're going to see are based on what we are finding in the clearances uh, found within the appendix. So here we have the operating room. Hospital op uh, operating room always accommodates anesthesia equipment. You can see here typically the dark blue is the uh, three by seven gurney for the patient or table. If you have a larger table, then everything gets larger. Uh, but for the planning purposes for these diagrams, we use three by seven. You have a sterile field to the two sides and the foot of the patient. We have the anesthesia zone to the head of the patient. That is that 48 square foot, uh, eight by six rectangle. Uh, sort of containing all that or outside of all that is the yellow portion or orange portion, the circulation pathway where the circulator walks to perform duties, cannot walk into the sterile field. This is really the activity that's happening to support what is happening in the sterile field, um, getting the equipment, the instruments and other things to the people who actually spend all their time within the sterile field during the procedure. And then um, to the two sides and to the foot, we have the clearances uh, for the movable equipment zone. You add all of that up, uh, you have a 20 by 20 room. It is listed uh, in the minimum requirements that your room must be 20 minimum width and 400 square feet clear floor area, but essentially 20 by 20 is 400 square feet. And that essentially is how the 400 square foot minimum requirements um, are made up. The operating room for outpatient, there are two styles of operating rooms. One is an operating room that you limit it to procedures that have a, um, that really do not require full anesthesia equipment. There are some procedures where some institutions are uh, stating that we have the need for operating rooms, but we do not have the need for the anesthesia equipment within those operating rooms. We know we're always going to use these rooms 
in this manner that we have determined we do not need the flexibility later to uh, accommodate anesthesia and therefore we do not want to build as large operating rooms uh, as if we were accommodating anesthesia equipment. So this type of operating room is uh, essentially the requires three feet for the sterile field wrapping all four sides of that patient or table, three feet to the two sides and uh, two feet to the foot for the circulation and that also includes to the size the equipment so in the outpatient operating room we have sort of merged the circulation and the equipment zone as i mentioned before this is a limited type of use of operating room for greater flexibility or for um, if you have concerns that uh, the need may change or you cannot quite predict um, I would recommend strongly that you move more towards the minimum requirements required for this operating room. You can see that the last one, uh, the minimum clear floor area was 255 square feet. For this one, it's 270 square feet because we are adding an additional three feet beyond what was already provided at the patient's head and uh, which accommodates the anesthesia work zone. So for the difference of 15 square feet, this operating room affords you the flexibility of never having to worry uh, whether you have uh, provided an operating room that is too small to accommodate safely the anesthesia equipment and the activity involved. Again, we're only looking and discussing uh, minimum requirements. Um, so these are the starting base point to then uh, establish what size operating room you need. Here you'll see that the width is the same as the one we had seen previously, a minimum width of 15 feet. The room does become a little longer and that is how we establish the 270 square foot clear floor area within uh, these rooms. So, uh, whoops, I jumped over one here. The one thing that I did want to spend a little bit of time is that there is something new in the, F well, there's lots of stuff new in the new FGI 2018, but uh, we did want to acknowledge in a concrete way uh, the fixed encroachment. We know with renovation, with existing conditions, with uh, columns, with chases, with shafts, that often we uh, see ORs, which are large, uh, with um, uh, uh, encroachments or columns or other things along the perimeter, typically along the perimeter. And um, what we have done is we are referring to encroachments that fall within the minimum clear floor area. So you don't have to worry about this if your encroachment falls outside of your minimum clear floor area. If you had a 500 square foot operating room here for outpatient or hospital based typical OR and you had a you know three by three column along a perimeter you would be okay. What this allowance is is when your when you for space constraints uh, are designing quite close to your minimum requirements that if a if an intrusion or encroachment falls within the clear floor area we have now put some limitations on that and that limitation is that it cannot penetrate or move into that clear floor area footprint uh, into it more than 12 inches nor can it take up uh, a, a length uh, of space that is more than 10% of the length of that wall that the encroachment falls upon. So if this were a 20 by 20 uh, foot operating room, 400 square feet, you would be allowed a one foot by two foot uh, intrusion into that space, which is two square feet, that would be allowed. We did this for two reasons. One is 
really there was no recourse and no help for authorities having jurisdiction um, as to the size of uh, obstacles uh, moving into the um, sort of the working zone of operating rooms and procedure rooms. So we wanted to help out the authorities having jurisdiction, but also the designers and institutions where we now have something that we can po point to. The other reason we did it is that in conversation and, and over the years, I have discovered that um, talking to a number of authorities having jurisdiction, that some would interpret uh, in this diagram here, the space that falls above and below that, uh, if you can see the cursor, I'm not sure, the space that falls above and below to either side of this encroachment, they would consider those as alcoves. And if they consider those as alcoves, they then argue that from the outer face of this encroachment to this far wall, you only have 19 feet of minimum clear width, number one, and you've subtracted a full feet of 20 feet, so you've taken 20 feet out of the 400 square foot clear floor area and you're actually at 380, and therefore you no longer meet the minimum requirements. So we wanted to um, um, uh, actually take a stance that an encroachment does not make the space to the either side of it uh, alcoves, that the space to either side of it counts within the clear minimum width requirement, and it also counts as the minimum clear floor area. Now, with the space we're showing here, if you did have this encroachment, we have taken two square feet out of the minimum clear floor area, and you would have to put two more clear, floor, uh, clear uh, square feet back in somewhere else in order to maintain the 400 square uh, clear floor area requirement in this situation. Um, so David is going to take us through this slide, and then I'm going to wrap up. Hey, thanks, Brian. Um, Brian has taken us, as only he can, way down into the weeds with encroachments and how they are viewed by the AHJs. Want to come back up to, to the clouds, about 30,000 feet. We've got two sort of summary slides for you to consider, really just reflecting uh, nothing new, but just summarizing everything we have been talking about for the last hour or so. So as you can see on the left, what we just have is a little diagram showing you that the infrastructure requirements um, are really derived or are a function of uh, three main things. That's a type of procedure. We've talked about that, the level of invasiveness and tried to define that uh, in, in somewhat in terms of uh, risk for infection of the patients. And that also, of course, pertains to the uh, aseptic uh, techniques that are used and the general sterility of environment. Over on the right, and we've done this for, for uh, th this and subsequent slide, we've taken all three of the types of rooms that we have examined during this session, and just um, on, on, the, uh, on the rows on the left, and then on the columns going towards the right, we have selected uh, four attributes arrayed out in four columns, and for you to see really how they progress over that continuum, starting from exams through procedure and into operating rooms, and to see somewhat how they interrelate to each other. So as you can see, if you look at any one of those, it is truly a spectrum, a continuum, if you will, a scale from uh, more to less or less to more, depending how you want to um, articulate your definition. But again, level of, of invasiveness, the risk of infection, the general sterility of environment um, reflected by not only the air exchanges, but by the access, whether it's restricted or unrestricted. And then, as Brian has articulated in great detail, some of the considerations that transform the way that the environment is finished in terms of the surfaces and what needs to be done to make sure, again, that we provided this most safe environment in which to provide our patients the care that they deserve. So I'm going to have Brian take a look at similar features on the next size slide that really just talks about the room size as we have described it previously. Brian.
Brian. Great. So here, um, the questions we need to ask and the factors we need to consider when determining the room size, obviously, we need to start with the minimum requirements, but then we build on that, you know, the type of procedure which normally uh, then has an association with the number of staff required. Uh, the more staff um, uh, typically uh, requires a greater amount of space, um, the amount of equipment, and then you'll see on the far right column there, uh, the square footages from a minimum point of view that we had gone over uh, earlier. So really, you know, all of these things from uh, room use and room size are factors and considerations that we are looking at when you're planning these rooms and determining uh, what shape and how large and what the infrastructure is for each of them. I think we actually want to um, get into questions, so we're not going to go into the pre and post procedural patient care stations. Uh, I do recommend that you take a look at those sections. We are allowing the combination of those two um, in the FGI guidelines. Um, so that's something uh, that might be of interest uh, to you. I do want to remind you that this is a part one uh, that David uh, Shapiro and I have been um, talking to you about today which is focused on the exam procedure and operating rooms. There is an appropriate room use part two, which uh, with Tobias Gilk and myself, that focuses in more on the imaging room classification. So taking what we've learned today from the part one and actually uh, applying it and seeing what the synergies are to the imaging room classifications. In short, uh, what is interesting is we have worked very hard in the 2018 guidelines to align the requirements of an exam room to a class one imaging room, a procedure room to a class two imaging room, and an operating room to a class three operating room. You are going to see a lot more similarities and a lot more clarity. So sign in and sign up for that part two imaging room classifications. So, Heather, I, I don't know if there's time for questions or not, but um, or if any came yeah, in. Yeah, I think we have, I think we have a little bit of time. Um, David, Brian, thank you both so much for digging into the guidelines uh, to provide us with this detailed overview of exam procedure and operating rooms. Uh, so, I do have a few follow-up questions for you. The first one is, um, I noticed that you didn't talk about trauma rooms. Would you consider? trauma rooms to be procedure rooms, operating rooms? Where do they fall on the continuum? Uh, Brian, if it's okay with you, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I think we could do sure. easily another longer than an hour presentation just on trauma rooms. Um, and I, I'm going to kind of hedge bets and say, especially after um, what we have just discussed, that they really do have attributes of all three because so many different things can be done for so many different kinds of patients in so many different kinds of situations. They probably fall somewhere uh, in that mid-range, so they're probably closest in most attributes and characteristics to what we've described procedure rooms as, especially because in most instances, again, not all, they are located um, adjacent to or directly accessible from an emergency room. So you lose that ability, if you recall one of the earlier diagrams that we have, uh, to have them located in what would be considered to be a restricted area. But great question and certainly a topic that uh, both the Facility Guideline Institute and possibly in another uh, format, we can dive deeper into a better answer to that question. And Brian, maybe you got some thoughts to add on to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I will add, and uh, I agree because the ASHRAE requirements for um, the MEP uh, airflow uh, of uh, three outside air changes per hour and 15 uh, total for the trauma room is uh, identical to what is required for the procedure room. Uh, I do want to also point out, though, which often leads to some confusion, and you are right, David, in our presentation may not be enough or, or discussion, but 
you know, the fact that uh, you are allowed to have a scrub sink or scrub um, position either directly outside or directly inside the trauma room acknowledges that there is some uh, emergent um, activity that may require scrubbing going on there. So that sometimes confuses people uh, as to whether things are truly operations in there or not. Um, but we also know that um, the uh, requirements for square footage at 250 square feet, but you can actually have shared trauma rooms that are divided, which I think the minimum requirement is 200 square feet per. Um, I do want to point out, and I think I am um, uh, recollecting correctly, that there, there was um, an interpretation and errata issued uh, specifically about the scrub sinks. And if there is a scrub sink within the room itself, uh, that you therefore don't also have to provide additionally a hand wash sink, that the scrub sink technically is the hand wash sink and therefore you don't have to have double sinks in there. Um, so if you are designing trauma rooms, you should actually look out and do some research and, and, and take a look because I think you're gonna find that on the FGI website. So. Yeah, thanks Brian. All, um, all errata on the 2014 edition, 2018 edition, uh, going back, they're all posted and will remain on the FGI website. So, um, Definitely do go there. Um, the next question that I have is for you. The diagrams that you've shown today and the presentation are really helpful. Are these in the new guidelines edition? Um, I'll take that since I drew the diagrams. Uh, no, they're not. Um, I'm thinking of actually charging money and selling them because lots of people have asked for them. Uh, I am happy to share them if anybody wants to email me. Uh, I, we on FGI I think it's very important to not have diagrams within the um, main body of the FGI itself. I will say that there's a lot of discussion right now uh, within the uh, Beyond Fundamentals uh, of uh, the importance of providing diagrams and we are seeing whether we can actually um, uh, be able to achieve that and uh, uh, maybe sometime in the future you might start seeing those. But um, I'm very happy to share these diagrams. Um, they've been fun to create and do and, and they really, for me at least, a, a visual person, they help um, help explain uh, better uh, what we're really trying to say in in words. So, and I'll add to Thanks, that. Um, great answer. Go Just ahead, from David. board level, is that uh, we are always very interested in what your needs are. If things like the diagrams would be helpful, um, that is something that the organization really would like to hear from from any um, any attendee to this webinar or any other circumstances in which you can communicate things that FGI can better help you in your profession. We would appreciate hearing from you. Uh, and I should let everybody know that both Brian's and David's email addresses are provided at the end of the presentation, so you can follow up with Brian directly. Please don't spam him. Um, you can also reach out to FGI at info at fgiguidelines.org. Uh, last question. Is where can I get access to the Clemson study that you referenced? Oh, oh, okay, yeah, no, uh, good question, and um, it's a great study. Uh, it was published by the Journal of uh, the American Society for Anesthesiologists, so I think if you go to their website or ASA publications, uh, you will find it there. It has a very long name, something like Realizing Improved Patient Care Through Human-Centered Operating Room Design or something. Um, I know David Allison was one of the authors from Clemson. I think a prime author was Palmer. So if uh, if you just go to the journal for uh, American Society for Anesthesiologists, you're going to be able to find that and you're going to be able to um, um, uh, pull that down and print it and, and uh, take a look at it. So. Okay, great, thanks. That is all the time that we have today. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks to our presenters. Brian Langlands and David Shapiro. Please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of this session for information on receiving learning units or a certificate. You must be registered through MADCAD to take the survey and obtain credit.
Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. We hope that you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Sign up for FGI's quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or follow us on LinkedIn to stay current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.